welcome. I'm Brinton Likes, and along with Tim Cars here and Bonnie Waldron, we facilitate the Center for Human Rights and International Justice here at Boston College, one of the co-hosts of this evening's events, along with the School of Theology and Ministry. Um, we're delighted to welcome here this evening Ricardo Faya from Guatemala, and we're also particularly honored to have another guest from Guatemala, Emma Alicia Velasquez Nimatu, who's here teaching in Rhode Island for the year and joined us this evening for this event. Um, as many of you know, Ricardo Faya Sanchez was born in Guatemala, in Guatemala City, and we have one of his childhood friends who also is joining this evening, known him all his life. He became first a Jesuit and then an anthropologist, and he completed his PhD at the University of Texas in Austin. After having studied theology in Innsbruck, Austria, with Karl Rahner, among many others, he has dedicated his life to documenting the lives and cultures of the Maya in Guatemala and of other indigenous peoples in Central America. As many of you know, his writings have engaged with these communities from the perspective of their beliefs and their customs, but also he has engaged with those who have tried to destroy their communities through brutal massacres in the early 1980s and in a variety of struggles for justice and human rights. Between 1982 and 1993, he spent a number of years, including some of the worst of the armed conflict, accompanying what were then to, to become the communities of populations and resistance in the East Khan. We are exceptionally fortunate to have him here with us this evening. His visit to the United States has been organized by a wonderful group of graduate students from City University of New York who have begun a graduate student organization to strengthen ties between the North and the Global South. And Lily Quiero is here with us this evening if anybody wants to talk to her at the book exhibit afterwards. I'm delighted to be here with you all and to welcome Ricardo and we'll have an opportunity. He will present and then you'll have plenty of time for questions and discussion and then afterwards for a brief reception and anybody who's interested in buying books is welcome to do so. Thank you. which is uh, the title of the lecture is Accompaniment and Solidarity in Context of War Experience <coughs> from the Guatemala, from the Ishkan, Guatemala. <laughs> so uh, I'm not going to be very, uh, very long talking, uh, just to the point, and maybe after I talk, I'm going to show some some pictures so that you may uh, realize with your eyes <laughs> what I have been talking about. Um, but uh, before reading some of the <coughs> notes I have written here, I just uh, want to explain uh, um, what place of Guatemala I am talking about. So if you uh, excuse me, um, because this is what we do in uh, elementary school. <laughs> if you excuse me, I'm going to draw a, a very simple map of Guatemala in order to show you where Ishkan is Ishkan. Um, this is Guatemala. <coughs> here you have Mexico and here you have the United States. People who walk all the way to the States, they walk this way, yeah? And El Salvador and 
Honduras. In Nicaragua, yeah? well, this is Guatemala, and this is, this is the place that I'm going to be talking about, which is called Ishkang. Uh, when this happened, it was jungle. Um, you spell it this way, Ishkang. And it was a war zone, uh, internal conflict uh, in Guatemala. Yeah? And this is where uh, when, the when, uh, I'm going to talk about a period where uh, I was there during the internal conflict of what <coughs> uh, I was there during 1983 to 93. But I was all, only mm, six years there, in two periods. So I'm going to talk especially <coughs> about um, five months I spent there in the from September 1983 to February 84, when uh, the war was uh, very, very, very hard for the people who were living there. The pictures I'm going to show afterwards, there are more to this period. Uh, so you will see, in a way, some sort of uh, non-correspondence because during this time, uh, the population that was under the shadows of the jungle uh, had uh, progressed economically. You can notice that. You will notice that by the dresses. Huh? Well, <coughs> the war, because we said accompaniment and soli accompaniment solidarity in context of war. So, very, very short war in Guatemala. As I said before, the technical term which we use is not uh, war, but we use another term which is uh, internal conflict, because it is a war, but not between two states, two nations but it is a war within Guatemala. Uh, it, it had its, its roots um, uh, are in the structural injustice. 500 years since the Spanish conquest. But war started, war itself, started after the 1954 invasion of Guatemala by a group of military who were backed by the United Fruit Company and the government of the United States and toppled down the Arbenz regime, which was a socially minded uh, government, and stopped the agrarian reform in 1958, uh, it was against the United Fruit Company. So uh, Eisenhower was the president, and Alan Dulles was the Secretary of State. Uh, he had uh, uh, his brother was a Jesuit. <laughs> <laughs> um, so after 1954, the first guerrilla organized in 1968, 62. That's the year when war started. But it started in the eastern side of Guatemala. 
this is the first wave <coughs> of guerrilla groups uh, started here on the side of Guatemala. And the second wave started in the western side where the Maya indigenous population lives. Um, so um, the second wave was started in 1972 with the backing of the indigenous population, the same population that was mm, cruelly massacred in 1982, genocide, which is, which happened a little bit before I entered into Ishkam. The massacres were spread all around the highlands of Guatemala, and mainly this area of Ishkam suffered of a tremendous uh, uh, series of massacres. I believe outside there is a book which is called Massacres in the Jungle, which is uh, one I wrote after being there. But uh, after the 1982 massacres, which uh, can be defined as genocide, the guerrilla groups were not defeated completely. And a war, a very ferocious war, lingered in small distant pockets of Guatemala until 1996, when the peace agreements were signed between the government and the union of the three main guerrillas. So uh, even if the, these pockets of guerrilla, so to say, <coughs> were in distant places of Guatemala, the war was still a national happening. Yeah? Well, I happen to be now something, a little bit about the, about the experience. I happen to be in the northern part of Quiche, here in Ishkan, a jungle area. Um, when I mean jungle, uh, I mean trees that are, you will see them later. Yeah? You have to <coughs> phrase them with the help of three <coughs> persons. Yeah. And jungle, uh, uh, such a jungle, that permits, permits you to live under the trees and not been seen by helicopters or by, by planes. Well, after the genocidal massacres of 1982, what did the people do? Let's say that the army, the soldiers uh, encircle a village and kill in one or two or even three days uh, all, everybody who is encircled. Men, women, old people, children, babies, every person, yeah? What did the people do, those who were able to flee, to escape? or those who were not uh, encircled uh, in the village, what did they do? Well, they escaped, <coughs> Be frightened, panicked. Mm -hmm. And they took uh, three main directions. Uh, the main, the bulk of the population went to Mexico fled to Mexico. Mexico, maybe two or three hours or four hours away from where the massacre occurred. 
let's say this is the town, this is the marketplace, they have a church here, but people had their huts in distant places. And they came for market day here, but not everybody came. And so these people were, were killed. But these others, what they do? <coughs> so I say they took three directions. One was north to Mexico. The other direction was back to the places where they had come in order to colonize the jungle. And the third, the third group or the third said, we will stay here. <laughs> we, will, we will not run away. We are in resistance. In order to understand what resistance <coughs> means, you can think of the French resistance during World War II. Yeah? Civilians who back in different ways the army, let's say the American army against the Nazi army, more or less. That's more or less the way how it worked. Yeah? And then those people who stayed in the area didn't leave their own territory, their own land where they cultivated, and had a purpose of staying there. Of course, one purpose, one reason was not to lose their land. But another purpose was to back the one side of this long-term war. That means back the guerrillas, yeah? And how did they back them? They gave them food. Uh, they gave them information, which was very, very important in a war, where the enemy is. And they backed them with uh, other tasks like carrying ammunition or whatever it is. Yeah? So um, uh, the civilians were backing uh, one side of the struggle, which was a war because it was an armed struggle, backed one side of the, the struggle. And so in this sense, they participated in war, but they didn't shoot. Maybe their children were in the guerrillas, yeah? but the, the men or women or fathers or grandparents, or, they, they were not, they were not combatants. They, they, uh, According to uh, international law, uh, they, they could not or should not be attacked by an army, by the, the state army, by the soldiers. As uh, in, in comparison, uh, guerrilla, the guerrillas could attack the soldiers, but could not attack the 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 cook in the kitchen. <laughs> She's a civilian, yeah. But the army did attack civilians and massacred them. So the purpose of this 
war from the point of view of the revolutionary uh, army, the guerrillas, which in this place was called EGP, Ejército Guerrero de los Pobres. The purpose was twofold. One was to capture the state, the government. And the other one was to, uh, to create a new society, just society. Yeah? The, the guerrillas thought that they would create this just and equalitarian society through power, uh, through the government, with laws and so on. But first of all, they had to take hold of the government. Yeah? Um, there were in this area about maybe, maybe too much if I say 200 people of the guerrilla. And the army had sometimes four battalions, which is around 2,000 people, 2,000 soldiers. And they had helicopters and fast war planes. We used to call them A37B, which is a certain, and a factor of ammunition. So it was much more powerful. That's the war. The second accompaniment. Uh, the main difference uh, between the army and the guerrilla was that the people backed freely the guerrillas, while the army in order to support, in order to get the necessary support of the people, used uh, violence. First killed people, and through panic, uh, organized them in uh, uh, villages. As uh, Rios Montt used to say, Rios Montt was the the state chief, he used to say, fusiles o, fri fusiles o frijoles, two Fs, fusil, guns, or frijoles, beans. We give you beans if you do not resist anymore, yeah? Otherwise, we will give you guns. So guns, or beans, he used to say. Huh? That was the way how Rios Mont organized civilians. But the question is, how could the civilians live in this place under the jungle? Um, how could they survive? Uh, against or in front of one of the best trained uh, army in Latin America in counterinsurgency. Well, first of all, after the massacres, as I said, the people hid in the jungle. Uh, about when I entered there, there were about 30 small groups of maybe 50, 70 people each of the groups that were hiding under the shadow of the, of the jungle. And they, they all organized a network, <coughs> a network of these 30 groups so as to transmit 
through couriers, correos, hmm? right. hmm? who uh, took notes in the nylon envelopes through the through the jungle from one to the other group, yeah, informing exactly where the army was in such and such a moment. Hmm? So that uh, there are 30 groups, and the ar army is there. This one is secure, this one here, because it has received the note that the army is over there. Yeah? But those groups that are next to the place where the army is, they are expecting the news of the exploration that will let them know what to do. And then when they receive the news that the soldiers are coming in order to take the camp where they are, what they do, or what we do, is to escape, to move, to move maybe two hours away from the place where we were before. And in moving, you have to be careful not to leave your footprints, so you try to find uh, creeks or small rivers and you spread so as not to live, leave a, a, a trail where the, the, the army can follow you. Then, of course, that means that you have to, you have to take the children, you have to take your pots and you have a, you have you have to make a, a, a what's the name? Tienda de campaña, tent, tent, with a plastic. Each family had a plastic. You have to make a, a hut, or at least a structure where you put the the plastic. And, but that's very easy in the jungle because you have you have you have small trees where you can cut them and. Make a, make the structure of a but you know just throw the the nylon and then you are going to be at night. Usually during night the soldiers don't don't uh, advance. And when you get there, the woman, the uh, family mother, uh, who is the one who makes the tortillas, uh, she asks his husband to clamp the, what do you call, the mill. <laughs> and then she is, she, and she makes fire, and, and maybe at nine o'clock, everybody sitting down on the grass, under the nylon cover, and eating warm tortillas, warm tortillas, and drinking maybe warm atoll, no? which is like the mana <laughs> in, in, in times of Moses, yeah? What the heck of food is this one, yeah? <laughs> mana, he used to say, yeah, <coughs> delicious. Delicious because you are hungry. You are hungry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, accompaniment. What did we do in our pastoral work? According to Monsignor Romero, in his third pastoral letter, he says that accompanying pastoral, a pastoral de acompañamiento is a special type of pastoral. Uh, the core of this pastoral is to be with the people, to be with them, not to lead them while they are fleeing, but to follow them 
not to feed them, but to be fed by them. Not to defend them or protect them, but to be protected by them. Not to teach them, but to be taught by them. We had been, we had been trained in Cuba how to make uh, the self-defense and how to teach <laughs> the people in the jungle. When we arrived in the jungle, they taught us all the time there. They led us. They fed us. Mm -hmm. They knew more and had never and had more expertise with the machete to cut the sticks and place them in the hole where the soldiers were to fall. So a compliment was to be with the people. Not only one day or one week or one month, but years. That was, I think, love. That was lack of power. So different, I usually think, to the parishes, where the pastor is like a king. <laughs> or where the pastor is on the top of a bureaucracy. <laughs> or maybe who has a lot of projects. I'm not against projects here. <laughs> so, three, solidarity. But uh, I ask myself, were we an idle person eating <coughs> and not contributing with something? Why did the people give us tortillas? Because no money circulated here. Yeah? No dollars, no quetzales, no, no money at all in this uh, area. Uh, I would say two things, and then I finish. First, we were supposed to administer sacraments, mainly baptism and Holy Supper, Mass. Just an example, baptism. Baptism, according to the traditional mentality, protects the child from spirits and disease. But that was not the main uh, uh, sense of this sign that makes, <coughs> creates children of God. To them, hmm? The army used to throw leaflets with helicopters, <coughs> and the leaflets had pictures uh, where we were monkeys with tails, <laughs> or demons with horns. That's what the army wanted to transmit to us. You are like animals living in the jungle. Go out of the jungle and come to us. Well, we were not animals. We were God's children. We had dignity. And the jungle became, as they say in Kiche, the holy, holy mountain, the holy jungle that protected us like Noah's ark. This was a metaphor used there. When the flood came, the ark, hmm? those who went into the ark, the jungle, those survived. So by baptizing children, uh, the sign of baptism would say to them, 
you are children of God. You are human beings. You are not animals. We have dignity. We are here because we are resisting. We are in this national or maybe international struggle. Yeah? And second, by being there, we help the people to conceive of their struggle as a struggle that was blessed by God. Of course, this is tricky. <laughs> of course, this is tricky. Yeah? The civilians supported the guerrillas. As I said before, they did not shoot, but their children shot. We, as shepherds, by being with them, blessed, we blessed their war. We were not, I have to say this, we were not neutral chaplains. I can ask if there is a neutral chaplain in a war, yeah? If, if a priest is a chaplain in the American army, I guess he is in favor of the American army in this war. <coughs> Maybe the, it is more complicated than this because you can think of the Vietnamese war. And I imagine that many priests were chaplains but were already against the war in Vietnam, but they were there mm, for other reasons, you know. But we were in favor of that war. We thought that the, that revolutionary war was a just war because all other uh, all other possibilities, uh, peaceful possibilities, have been closed. So we thought that was a just war. Just as, as, as civilians in resistance thought it was just to fight, fight against the Nazis and <coughs> defend, their, defend their land and freedom. A war where God, the Almighty, was on the side of the poor, as Mary implies, implies it in the Magnificat. That's, the way how, that's how we thought. Now we saw that as I said in the seminar before, yeah, now we, saw, we, we see that this war was not just because at least one of the four elements of a just war was not present, which is uh, that a war, in order to go to war, uh, that war must be successful. You are not going to enter into a war that is going to be a failure without considering the civilian losses. Yeah? Well, conclusion. Yeah? Did we do something wrong? Maybe. Maybe. sincere and many many church people thought that this war was just but uh, in uh, accompanying the people we did not only have this purpose for the war but we also had 
the purpose of um, start starting to realize to create this new society which I think was a goal that was uh, uh, obtained you can go and visit the communities that now are in Ishkan and who were before here and uh, second conclusion is just a question is a just is is just war possible nowadays? Can we talk about a just war? And one of the reasons why we say that it is very hard to talk about just war nowadays is that most of the conflicts are internal conflicts nowadays and with the technology uh, the media facebook <laughs> drones oh, uh, it is uh, it, any war is very very dangerous especially for civilians uh, and that this line between uh, a civilian who has no weapons but is backing almost intrinsically backing the army uh, it is very hard uh, to make an army concede that this civilian population is civilian. It's the same from the point of view of the guerrilla. If you get into the point of view of the guerrilla, the guerrilla used to neutralize or execute those mainly men who were the spies of the army, even if they didn't have any weapons. Even in little, they had the, well, the same error of confusing uh, a civilian <coughs> population. And finally, for those who study theology, I don't know if this is a, an awkward question, excuse me, I am not a theologian, but uh, I usually I ask now, theologians are very much in favor of peace, not uh, exactly as they were before, yeah? and uh, of course they say the gospel is uh, an advocate of peace. But uh, is the gospel pacifist? I, I don't know if I should. Is the gospel pacifist because it was written after the Jude Judean insurrection that was a failure in the 70s? Did this affect the, 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 the back of the, 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 the loss, the, the insurrection was, was a failure, yeah? and well, Jerusalem was destroyed. Yeah? And they could see that this was not the way to bring in the kingdom of God. You know? Did this affect the vision of those evangelists or you know there were many many people who who wrote and 
the Matthew or Luke were written by many people, and you, you can find different layers, layers, you know, until you have <coughs> the final gospel. It is the final gospel we have, pacifist, because it was influenced by the, <laughs> this is the question. Well, this is all I have. Now I'm going to show you some, some pictures. As I said before, these were taken in a stage where these people were, were uh, much better off. Monsignor Romero. This is a Yacuria. He was a Baptist. La Iglesia Verdadera, the true church, has to adopt characteristics of clandestinidad y catacumbas. The church has to, the true church in these circumstances has to go to the catacombs again. This is uh, the border between Mexico and Guatemala. Ah. You see, the border is a line. Here is Mexico, here is Guatemala. This is the jungle, this is the jungle. <laughs> this is a map of all the small communities, the 30 communities in all the area. The, these red dots. Mm -hmm. Here is Mexico. This is an ethno map. For him who made it, the north is down. <laughs> <laughs> ethno map, yeah. <coughs> this is a hut under the trees. You see, it has a cover so that the helicopter doesn't move. Anthropology and pastoral activities. What? <laughs> this is my diary. <laughs> this is my diary. This is 24 October. Lunes, Monday. Yesterday, we saw Vimos a ah, oímos balacera, shooting, that we think is on above us. And we left the estampida. This is Civilians, children, we'll see. Children, oh, all you want. <laughs> Different, different uh, uh, Maya people. This is Todos Santos, Mam. 
This is a, these are Ishil. He's Hakaltek. He's oh. mom. <laughs> children, children. <laughs> All you want. <laughs> Civilians, big families. Why? Because arms, not arms, but your arms were necessary to work. <laughs> big families. Big family. This was a courier, courier who was killed in the mountain. His wife and one, two, three, four, five, <coughs> six. <laughs> how could people, how could people with so many children live there under attack? Economy. You have to cultivate. They killed the pig and they are distributing the food because the pig is communal. Sometimes we didn't have soap. This is very good too. Soap, this is like soap. <laughs> we were, this moment we were escaping, so we didn't have any huts. So during daytime, just waiting there. Canoes. This one is made out of a tree. This was a tree. They are now pulling the, the canoe into the main river. This is a typical guerrilla dress. There is a mechanic. <laughs> Rice, protection, militia. He is carrying my knapsack, hmm? but he is taking me from one community to another one. And he used a weapon in case we found the enemy in the road with the train. There he is. <laughs> you see? This is used as a sign. We all know in a certain moment that we are going to have this sign. If somebody sees you, that he's not going to shoot because you have this sign. Yeah? And here you have the pen who always is with us. <laughs> and the boots. You know? And the, the mochila, where you carry your, your uh, hammock. He is guerrilla. She changed her dress because she, is also, she was also a guerrilla in order uh, for the picture. Education. All those kids are going to go to the university, to Boston College. <laughs> <laughs> they are learning how to write. Read and write. <coughs> those are the desks. Yeah? <laughs> and look at their faces. They are, they are all happy. Look at this one. <laughs> they are all happy. Resistance, 
without happiness is impossible. <laughs> teacher. The children, they have their own, <coughs> their own games in the jungle. Pastoral work. <coughs> it's a mimeograph we had. Wow. One, one, and here are the, the pages on our uh, drawing. <laughs> That's a catechist, a meeting of catechists. What is this? Communion. Okay. First communion. <laughs> <coughs> Women had their class, but the the catechist was not a, a woman because, well, um, gender relationships were not uh, the main example of this. <laughs> Marriage. That's Holy Week. <laughs> we didn't have any hosts, so we had to use bread. Guerrilla and women. Guerrilla are also, these are guerrillas. They have any class with women. This one is also very uh, out of the jungle. This side. Uh, when are we going to go out of the jungle? That was the aspiration all the time. Hmm? We started to go out of the jungle, to leave the jungle, when we received a visit by civilian helicopters. And this is the end. This is the a picture of the holy jungle that protects us. Well, that's all, thank you. Special uh, logistical and uh, training support from Israel work. I, uh, Israel was very active in uh, Central America during the 80s. Rio Smont, I think, uh, was also using their services. And I also wanted to ask you about more recently uh, what Jimmy Morales has been doing. Uh, it doesn't seem to be uh, that much different except for the, the counterinsurgency practices of, of Rio Smont. Because many of the migrants that are coming to the United States uh, trying to enter illegally are coming from Western Guatemala. And it's a steady stream of them. So even if the revolution was moderately successful, it doesn't seem to be that the aftermath has created stable communities where people want to stay and, and make their lives. Or they have to go elsewhere, migrating now and taking the risks and paying coyotes and so forth to try and come here so that they can go back and maybe uh, have the means to uh, create a better kind uh, of conditions for themselves. The, uh, Israeli didn't train 
Guatemalan army, but gave them, gave them support to uh, intelligence and uh, ammunition yeah. and uh, planes, Araba, yeah. different ways. Yeah? Yeah. I would say that they were trained not directly by the Americans in that moment, but they had the manuals, the theory out of uh, the American experience in Vietnam and also the uh, experience in Algeria, the French. Right. And as far as Jimmy Morales, well, it, it's a different uh, moment right now. Uh, For those who don't know, Jimmy Morales is the current president. The current president of Guatemala. He is... Uh, uh, within a group of uh, military, but they are not uh, killing people in massacres as they, as they did before. They had different uh, different tactics. Yeah? Yeah. Jesse? Uh, Jesse, it's a big question, so, <laughs> but I, I'm wondering if you can comment on what happened after people came the jungle and what that process looked like specifically from the point of view of your role and others that played your role in accompanying the people. Yeah. Well, uh, when they came out of the jungle, uh, they were joined by refugees coming back from Mexico to the same place where they had been so a sort of tension uh, grew out of of this uh, this uh, of these two populations, even if they were friends. But same at, at the moment of occupying the same territory, there were problems. But the, the bulk of people who were resistant received uh, through the help of church a piece, a big piece of land in another place. And they said, we don't want to fight anymore. Yeah. So let the refugees come in and we are going to go to some other place. Yeah. It was very, very, very interesting yeah, to, see, to see that. And now, uh, you go there, you go to Ishkang, and you visit the community, which is called Primavera de Ishkang. And, uh, well, uh, it's an example of, uh, of organization and communal life. La communal life you know? Always with problems, of course. Everywhere you find problems. But there is maybe another one maybe another community in the whole Ishkan, which is which can be compared to this one. You can go there and, visit and find out whether I am truth, saying the truth or not. <laughs> yeah, they are, the army has said, no, those are lies. Go ahead, visit them. to be here with you. Um, a little over 10 years ago, I was in Nisqua as an accompanier mm -hmm. in the commu community of Puerto Pueblo. You were in Puerto Pueblo? I was in Puerto Pueblo for about nine months in oh, 2006. Months. Mm -hmm. And um, in preparation, I read Massacres de Vizemba. Uh -huh. um, and so it's, it means a lot to me to be here and also to hear all of this after many years mm -hmm. away from that experience. Um, I guess a couple of thoughts. Uh, can well, you can you hear her? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, one thing is um, that I just want to share briefly because people may be interested is there's an accompaniment project here in Boston, the Boston Immigrant Justice Accompaniment Network, which uses the same principles of accompaniment with people who are facing deportation proceedings. And there's so much I've taken from my experience with Nisqua in Guatemala. Um, and working with the genocide survivors uh, as they were 
witnesses in the trial um, that I brought to the accompaniment work here. And if people are interested in that, um, or if anyone else is involved in that, um, we can talk. My question for you, and of course part of this is me wondering, is um, have you stayed in communication with the communities that you knew at, um, during that time? And what do you see like the main issues that they're facing now? Um, I know what the issues were 10 years ago, but I had no way to stay in touch. I go there maybe once a year, for almost a week. Uh, now there is WhatsApp. WhatsApp? Yeah. <laughs> WhatsApp? They all have this, so we, we all communicate. I would say that the main issue probably is youth. What do we do with these young people? who are rebellious, and uh, maybe some of them uh, take drugs, or, uh, but uh, if you have a youth that is rebellious, or, uh, and you have a, a set of norms of communal work and so on, uh, then uh, of course, even if it's good to be, to rebel against, uh, <laughs> but the whole, the whole structure of this, uh, of the community, is like an earthquake, you know? <coughs> that's, I would say that's the main issue. Mm. Yes, Jeff. Briefly, uh, we had a, the initiative of going back into Guatemala uh, while we were in Nicaragua, working there. Uh, and we formed a group. We got the backing of uh, the, our superiors, Jesuit superior, not of the bishop, because the bishop there was against the guerrilla, eh? so we couldn't trust him. But we got the blessing of the bishop of Chiapas, on Samuel Ruiz, no? And with this blessing, we went into this territory. But in order to get into <coughs> the territory, you need a sort of a visa. And we talked in Nicaragua and in Mexico with the leaders of the guerrilla group who were in charge. They were like a government in a free land, in a land where the state government didn't have a word to say here. Yeah? So we crossed the border, the border we, you saw, we crossed the border, we were led by people who were known by the people and, and uh, they told them, he's our compañero and uh, he's a compañero. Uh, they, they changed our names. Uh, so I was Marcos, Marcos. You know? And uh, the people would call me Father Marcos. They called me Marcos, no? Marcos. Sometimes they said, Compañero Padre Marcos. <laughs> <laughs> that was the, the, the way how to, you had to get the approval of the guerrilla. No? And the guerrilla would give you uh, the approval if the guerrilla trusted you. Because if you get if you get in a, a priest who's going to to 
su hacer trabajo de descomposición. Upset the cart. Upset the cart. They will let you in, or they will throw you out. Eh? So we had that trust, mutual trust. A Leninist, Marxist and Leninist guerrilla uh, let us in their territory. But we were following a tradition of a companion. I, I talked about the letter of Romero, but before that, uh, Fidel Castro, in the Sierra Maestra, and also priests <laughs> yeah. doing a companion, but it was not, that was not the term used. It was not theology and so on. You drew a contrast at one point in your talk between the type of accompaniment you were involved in, the being with, with uh, the way a parish might be run by a pastor. And you also noted that they were different, and so in the parish it was appropriate to have projects. But from your experience of those years accompanying as a chaplain, do you think there are any lessons to be learned by people who are in parish situations or in authoritarian religious structures in terms of a different kind of accompaniment? Or do you think they're just different spheres and you wouldn't compare them? I think maybe some of my friends who are younger, they may say, that's your ideology. But I think that a good, well-organized parish where you need some sort of money to make projects, for uh, example, to get water for the people, even if that water should be, those projects should be done by the government itself, and other, or uh, for uh, children, would need nutrition. We have now in Santa Maria Chiquimula, where I live, we have projects here. Nutrition, <coughs> uh, a clinic, a clinic, because the one that the government has is not enough. Well, and so a school, like sort of a parochial school, well, we have that too. I think that's okay. I think it is good and people need it. <clears throat> but you have to be with the people. You have to go, like Francisco says, go to the streets or go to their houses and uh, be there. Strip off of your, your uh, hierarchical Symbolic uh, <laughs> symbolism. Yeah? Go in buses with them. Don't don't have your car all the time. Get in the buses, even if it's dangerous, even if they you may be stolen. Go there and be nobody, or be someone like they are. Uh, that's what I I think. Is, is, uh, should be, I think, in any parish and in any pastoral work or educational work. Of course, not uh, any uh, Each person has his own way of uh, style, style of life. Or I am old already, I'm 86. I cannot be all the time with the people. I have to retire and go to bed early. <laughs> yeah. And I cannot eat anything they give me. Excuse me, but I am, maybe I, I am I'm not, not uh, in my life, maybe I am not doing what I am here preaching, yeah? <laughs> maybe not, yeah? but try, try 
try to go down. Don't be a, cler a cleric. That's the main thing of the church, clericalism. Clericalism. That's why children are abused, because of clericalism. So it's try to be transparent. Your private life in bed <laughs> should be the same as in public, you yeah? I think it's uh, an attitude that the church should have, I think, you know, in any place. I don't know if it's... No, sir. Thank you for, for the question, Kathy. <laughs> uh, one, I have two questions, but maybe for the time I'm just going to ask one and it's the most global one. I am from El Salvador, and it just happened that this previous week I've been watching a lot of documentaries about the guerrilla movement in El Salvador, you know, with the rebel radio, and they had all these stories about a new society, you know, that they were creating these spaces in rural communities where gender relationships and gender roles were being subverted, and people were uh, being equal to each other and all that. Uh, communities were created where they had more um, communitarian models, you know, like where they, uh, especially in Morazan, Chalatenango, they had these communities that were promoted as um, examples, you know, after the war of saying, this is how we plan to go on you know, after the war. And <coughs> it seems to me that um, that really did not last a very long. There's been a lot of disenchantment with the left, you know, after having two presidential uh, or two presidents in a row. And, and, and now you don't see um, that the hope that a lot of the people who were escaping, who were living in, in the jungle, you know, they don't see these spaces anymore. And my sense is that um, the models are exhausted in terms of, you know, the right was in power, the left was in power. And um, I remember uh, when I was a student, I worked with, um, child soldiers for UNICEF. And when I interviewed with them, you know, nine years after, they were like, we have nothing. We, you know, we're couriers, we were cooks, we, we sacrificed a lot. Some of them lost limbs. But at the end of the war, you know, 10 years later, nothing to show them. Do you think in Guatemala, you know, like Vishkal, Maybe an example of what could be done, maybe more or less well, so that hope can continue. Or do you think in Guatemala people are also losing hope that this model did not flourish, did not take root, or you just find it in a small pocket? But as a whole, maybe the conditions that gave rise to this war are still there. Well, models are temporal, yeah? so you cannot expect that a model will go on for for years and years. They they have to get exhausted unless they change. But it is uh, so. Uh, there is a disenchantment with revolution with revolutionary movements. You see now Nicaragua. And uh, something was wrong there, even at the beginning, I think. 
maybe it was a question of violence. But uh, we were enchanted with the Sandinista revolution. But then, and also with the FMLN, <coughs> And with the EGP or the all uh, revolutionaries and so on. But uh, corruption entered there too. Hmm? And I think now we have to find new models or new, new sparkles, sparks, sparks of, uh, of hope. But we have to look at what has been done. Not only say, well, that's, that's not good anymore. Yeah? That's what I, I don't know if I hear Malaysia has a couple of words about this. How do you feel it? Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think so. Yeah. So with that, hopefully, moment of hope. Um, I'd like to invite you to stay around afterwards and to um, come and browse the books that are available. I also just want to tell you about upcoming events. Ricardo will be with us again tomorrow at noontime in which he will be talking about defining genocide as always problematic as a part of the Rights and Conflict lecture series. And then on Friday of this week we have a talk in Barrett House on the Newton campus with Professor Victor Conde, who's going to talk about freedom of religion with a particular focus on Kurdistan and Kathmandu. And also, for those of you who are working with the detained and the threatened with deportation and other migrants here in the greater Boston area, Boston College's Center for Human Rights is hosting a workshop, participatory workshop, on Tuesday, October 23rd in McElroy. So please check out our website and sign up if you're working at all with this population. Uh, we think it's important to learn more about the current state of affairs and the laws here in the United States as you participate in that voluntary activity. And I want to thank the Nisqua accompanier and any of you who would like to learn more about her experiences to please uh, hang out afterwards. Thank you very much for coming.